Hi, I'm Braddock District Supervisor James Walkinshaw, and thanks for tuning in to Braddock Voices, where we talk to Braddock District and Fairfax County residents and leaders who are working to make our community even better. To stay up to date with future episodes, community news, and local events, sign up for our Braddock District email list. It's easy. Send us an email at braddock at fairfaxcounty.gov, and we'll send email updates directly to your inbox. And before we get started with our incredible guest today, as always, uh, I'm going to give you our animal spotlight. This is an animal that is available for adoption from the Fairfax County Animal Shelter right now. And today's four-legged friend animal spotlight is Stella, the Alaskan Husky. Stella is a gorgeous and smart two-year-old husky mix who weighs 45 pounds. She's been rehomed a couple of times, and now she's in need of a permanent home. She's smart and trainable, but needs someone willing to polish her up just a little bit. She likes to be around people, but doesn't love affection or playing at the moment. Her adopter will need to develop her trust in others. The animal shelter informs us that she has plenty of energy and walks well on a leash. But she does need to go to a home where there are no small animals, as she used to chase a cat that once lived with her. Stella has a lot of potential due to her natural intelligence and is well suited for someone who's willing to devote time to her development. If you're interested in meeting Stella, call my office at 703-425-9300 or email us braddock at fairfaxcounty.gov and we'll connect you with the animal shelter. And with that, uh, I want to introduce today's guest. Uh, today's guest is Dr. Gregory Washington, the president of George Mason University. President Washington became Mason's eighth president on July 1st, 2020, and we'll talk a little bit about that time. He's regarded nationally as a strategic and collaborative solutions-oriented leader committed to providing opportunities for students of all background. He's a former dean of the Henry Samueli School of Engineering at the University of California, Irvine, and the former inter interim dean of the College of Engineering at Ohio State University. President Washington is a first-generation college graduate. He's a New York City native who attended high school in North Carolina. He earned his bachelor's, master's, and his Ph.D., all in mechanical engineering at North Carolina State University. President Washington, thanks for joining us today. Great to be here. So I mentioned in your introduction that you became George Mason University's eighth president on July 1st, 2020. That's right. Which was the peak of the COVID-19 pandemic. Tell us about your experience taking over this very demanding, a job that's demanding under normal circumstances, mm -hmm. demanding when we're not in the middle of a pandemic. Tell us about your experience taking over as George Mason's president at that time. Well, to say it was a difficult time would be an understatement. I, I, I can tell you that uh, uh, I started, as you stated, on July 1st, and I remember walking into my first meeting, and they said, okay, here are the major issues in front of the campus. Uh, we're currently running a $109 million deficit because uh, there were no students on campus in the, you know, in, 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 in the, in, had to send I guess, everyone, in the spring quarter. Sent previous, everyone home or never. Had to never send everyone brought, home. Yeah. If we don't bring any students back at all for 2020, this will be easily a $150 million mm -hmm. deficit. Uh, you have to uh, figure out what issues uh, or what mechanisms we're going to put in place to keep our faculty and our staff safe. And then on top of that, uh, we had a march on campus literally the week before I arrived mm -hmm. where the students marched to the Mason statue and wanted to tear it down, right? So <laughs> that was the initial condition. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and to, so to say that there was a little bit of uncertainty was, is an understatement. But we managed through all of that. We showed that we can keep people safe. We have a record of uh, being one of the safest large institutions in our region. Uh, so we did extraordinarily well with that. Um, 
I think our total caseload last year was in the uh, for on campus students, uh, to, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of 300 or so, mm -hmm. which seems like a big number uh, until you get the until you understand that we had institutions who literally had five and 600 cases in a single weekend. Yeah. Right. And so we're talking about over the whole year. Mm -hmm. So, so, so we, we managed that really well. We work with state government and federal government to deal with our fiscal challenges and, and actually finished this past year with a, sur with a small surplus. Uh, we were able to put in place our anti-racism and inclusive excellence initiative mm -hmm. that kind of brought the campus together to deal with some of the issues that we <laughs> that that took place the week before I got there. Yeah. And so we had a whole host of really good outcomes uh, for the campus over uh, this this past year that kind of repositioned us. So so in, in the end, I, 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 A, I learned who on my team do I want in the foxhole with me, mm -hmm. right? Because you, you literally start in crisis and mm -hmm. you learn who can manage in crisis. Mm -hmm. And we learned that the institution can actually survive a significant hit. We didn't have to fire anyone. We didn't have to furlough anyone. Mm -hmm. we, we kept all of our staff. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad we did. If we had have done that, first of all, it would have made, it would, it would have mean, given the size of our employment mm -hmm. footprint in the area, uh, it would have been an economic hardship to the region. Mm -hmm. But we may not be able to hire those people back. Yeah, sure. <laughs> given the difficulties in sure. uh, bringing people back to work right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. And I highlighted the, the pandemic and COVID crisis that you faced when you took over. And I, you know, from, from my perspective at that time, one of my concerns was when, when you started bringing students back to campus that there would be fears in the broader community that you know, bringing students back to campus could potentially create outbreaks that could spread. And I, I have to give you a lot of credit because I think the way that you handled it and the university handled mm -hmm. it, both in terms of the, the safety protocols that you put in place, but also the transparent communication right. about those protocols and the, that process reduced a lot of those fears in, in the broader community. But you touched on um, another crisis that you also faced, um, uh, which is uh, na na national, a national dialogue and debate mm -hmm. about Black Lives Matter and racial justice. That's and right. that was a debate that was taking place on the campus and I'm sure still takes place today. And you established, as you noted, the Task Force on Anti-Racism and Inclusive excellence. Tell us about that. Why did you determine that was necessary and how far has it gone to addressing some of the concerns that, mm -hmm. that existed? Well, we, we knew it was necessary because we had a problem, right? We, we, uh, we literally had dozens of uh, instances and cases mm. of uh, students uh, feeling that they were not being welcome and embraced by the campus. We had cases of, st of faculty and staff uh, feeling the same way. And, and those issues were real. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so uh, so we knew that there were some issues that needed to be addressed. And we wanted to address them in a holistic and comprehensive manner. And so the way you do that is you bring the community together, right? I could have taken a small team of people and went you know, mm -hmm. behind the transom and came up with some ideas and then threw them over the fence and say, yeah. there you have it, here's a plan. Right. What we decided to do was to invite the community in, even though we knew going forward that some of what we were gonna hear was going to be uh, uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we brought them in anyway. We had uh, an initial team of more than 130 faculty, staff, and students mm. who form the, the actual right. task, task force. force. Uh -huh. And then that branched off to other uh, subgroups and, and, and mm -hmm. sub-subgroups. Mm -hmm. So all told, there's a large number of people involved mm -hmm. in this effort. Uh, they produced 62 recommendations for the campus. 
of which the campus is actively pursuing the first 15. Mm -hmm. And and so the idea is we didn't get in this situation in a year. You're not going to get out of it in yeah. a year. Yeah. Uh, you, you, you know, how do you eat an elephant? Mm -hmm. One bite at a time. And so the idea is you start off with a set of recommendations that you can manage. Mm -hmm. We work through those. We put a long-term uh, implementation team and a long-term advisory team in place mm -hmm. so that we're accountable year in and year out, right? So that's what we have. Yeah. Uh, what 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 will happen here is there'll be areas in which we'll make tremendous progress. We've already made tremendous progress in a couple of areas. We have inclusive excellence plans for all of our uh, academic schools and colleges right now. Mm -hmm. So that has been produced, and many of them, they not only have produced the plan, but they're actually showing outcomes rel relative to their plans. Mm -hmm. And so that's great to see. And so now we're extending that to all of our units, mm -hmm. not just the academic units, mm -hmm. not just the schools and colleges, but our auxiliary units and our operational units on campus as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Now, I want to circle back because I, I, I read just some of the highlights of, of your bio, but we want to learn a little bit more mm -hmm. about, about Greg Washington, maybe even before he became Dr. Dr. Greg Washington. And one thing I want to ask about is, uh, so you are, you are an engineer by training. I am. And you... Correct. You can correct me if I'm wrong here, but my sense is that's uncommon for folks who become president of a major research university like George Mason. Well, you know, it's interesting. I, it is uncommon. Okay. Uh, but it's part of a. I guess you can call it a trend. More becoming that's more happening common. more. That's happening nationally. I mean, yeah. if you think about just our region, mm -hmm. uh, the the two largest universities are the University of Maryland. And George Mason in our region. Yeah. The University of Maryland has a president who's an engineer. Okay, <laughs> all right. And, 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 yeah. and so does Mason. In fact, he and I were very, very close okay. and worked together for a number of years. And even Virginia Tech has put a new campus mm -hmm. in the Alexandria area. The person that's leading that, that whole campus, is an engineer Got who it. was a former engineering yeah. dean uh -huh. who knows... Myself and Daryl, we we yeah. we literally were contemporaries. Uh, Daryl and I have happened to have worked in the same area. I see Daryl at the same meetings. We mm -hmm. we viewed each other's papers. We mm -hmm. <laughs> we could literally be on the same committees with with, with each other's graduate students. We right. were, our work areas were that close. Okay, so, so tell us how uh, did your 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 training, your education as an engineer prepare you to do, to do the job that, that you're doing now? Well, look, the reality is there is a reason for this trend, and that is because uh, the, the particular skill set that engineering leadership brings to the problems that we face today is the kind of skill set that's necessary to be successful. Uh, look, we're dealing with tremendous change. And when I say tremendous change, you know, it took 38 years for television to reach 50 million people, right? It took your cell phone four years to reach 50 million mm -hmm. people. It mm -hmm. took Facebook two years, mm -hmm. right? So you see these technologies speed up. Um, I don't know if you have children or anything like I that. I do. I have one, yeah. How old? 11 months, so oh, not really too young. much into the technology. But yet. if you had a teenager, yeah. and especially if you had a teenage boy, they'd be playing a game called Fortnite right, right. now. No, yeah, and I know listeners out in, the, yeah. out in the ether here uh -huh. have children who play that game. Mm -hmm. Two weeks to 50 million users. And so mm -hmm. that, that, that tremendous change is happening, mm -hmm. and that tremendous change is being driven by technology, mm -hmm. and it's being driven by technology in a unique way. You need leaders who understand that change and are able to put policies and procedures in place that adapt to it. Engineers are well suited for that, mm -hmm. right? We also are dealing with tremendous competitors. Mm. And our competitors are not just the institution that is in the next city mm -hmm. or in the next state. Our competition is global. Mm 
Mm -hmm. Right? China has literally brought 800 million people out of poverty in the last uh, 20 some odd years. And those people are now competing globally for opportunities and jobs that literally were the purview of this country. Mm -hmm. And we have to prepare talent to be able to be competitive. We have to meet the, the ever-changing demands of industry and we have to position our academic programs to be able to, here's the interesting thing. Um, the top 10 in-demand jobs right now did not exist mm -hmm. 10 years ago. Yeah. And so, not all of them, but 60%. So about six of the top 10 in-demand jobs today did not exist 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so we have to create curricula. Mm -hmm. We have to create a coursework. We have to create students mm -hmm. who actually are prepared for the jobs of the future without knowing what those jobs will be when they start. Yeah. Most of those jobs are in the tech space. Mm -hmm. Engineering is driving that. And so having someone who understands that also uh, makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So, so, so my skill set, I mm -hmm. think, is well positioned to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but then personally, a lot, of the, a, a lot of the issues that I had to deal with uh, I had significant racial unrest mm -hmm. on my campus at NC State University back mm -hmm. when I was a student. Yeah, I, I was involved in that. I knew, mm -hmm. I, I understand how students felt during that time. I know how to manage and deal with it. Yeah. Uh, y you know, I took my major administrative jobs in Ohio mm -hmm. during the 08 <laughs> crisis, mm -hmm. you know, 07, 08, when there was a major downturn in the state of Ohio. Mm. And then in 11 and 12 and 13, when there was a major crisis in California, yeah. I had jobs there. Mm -hmm. So understanding how to build systems in times of economic hardship, mm -hmm. build organizations in times of economic hardship, understanding what investments to make and what investments should not be made is also an area. Yeah. When did you decide that you, you wanted to go into education leadership? So, so you were studying engineering, um, and you were the dean of an engineering school. What made you make that decision to go in that direction as opposed to going off and using your engineering right. training to, to do what well, most others would have done? Well, look, I, I've always been uh, fascinated and connected to automobiles and wanted uh -huh. to work in advance, uh, and, and still do. I actually okay. do to this day. Uh-huh. Uh, I work in advanced automobiles. I've built hybrid vehicles from scratch. Wow. I built a fuel cell vehicle. I hear you're an electric vehicle driver. Yeah, yeah. Um, I drive yeah. an electric vehicle. I drove yeah. a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle. Uh -huh. And that was my area of research. I, I, I love doing that. Yeah. Uh, but as a young student, uh, the it was the engineering dean at NC State who pulled me aside and said, look, we need more Americans to do science and, and technology and engineering. Yeah. We, we need more people in that space. Mm -hmm. And if you will commit to, I've seen your grades, yeah. and if you will commit to going to grad school and getting a PhD, mm -hmm. I will commit to making sure that you don't have to pay. Wow. And I said, okay, that's right. a good deal. Yeah. And, and, and so I remember the impact that one person, hmm. that one chance meeting, yeah had on my whole career and life. And for me, it became very obvious that I can put in place systems, I can put in place procedures and policies to have that impact mm. on the lives of other people. Mm -hmm. and, and so when I got my degree, I took a job as a professor, uh, and it probably is maybe six or seven years into that job where I knew that if it was gonna have impact, I mm -hmm. really needed to in administration, yeah. and so I, I just moved in that direction. Yeah, great. Now, I just want to kind of delve into something that's maybe a, a bit more philosophical, but um, one of the areas where I, George Mason University clearly really excels, especially under your leadership, is, is being nimble, being able to move and adjust quickly in the way that the market does. That's in right. In the way that the job market 
does and provide and and you and I have talked about this a little bit and I know you have more plans to do this even more but provide students what they need today the credentials the learning the education mm -hmm. to fill the jobs that exist and are going to exist um, but one of the things I, I wonder about in our education system in universities and 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 below is is there a tension between that um, kind of education that is is very um, job focused, um, maybe having the hard technical skills that are required to to earn a credential or fill a job, and the kind of more traditional liberal arts education that. Whether it achieved it or not, I suppose, is a fair question, but at least was designed to develop a whole person, mm -hmm. uh, someone who would be a healthy and responsible citizen and, and community member and had a broad perspective and maybe learned how to learn and how to train their mind so that they could then adapt to whatever right. the economy presented to them over the course of the next 50 or 60 years of their career. Do you see that as a tension in George Mason? How do you figure out how to do both, or do you not feel like you have to do both? They're they're complementary. Well, look, that tension exists everywhere. Right? Let me uh, say this first and foremost, and, ex and it exists because our current educational infrastructure is not sufficiently uh, designed for the challenges and problems in which we face. Mm -hmm. That's where the mismatch begins, mm -hmm. right? Uh, look, technology can solve the vast majority of the problems that we face as a society today, meaning that there is a technology solution mm -hmm. or sets of solutions that can help solve these problems, right? But when there's a technology solution at hand, there is not the political will. There are social economic issues. Mm. There are a whole host of other things that keep that technology solution from being implemented, right? And the individuals who are responsible on a, uh, who, who understand policy, who understand uh, the, 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 the human side of this, who understand the business side of it, oftentimes don't have enough understanding of the technology and no. the engineers the technologists don't have enough understanding of the humanists. So what that's telling you is that our systems are producing people who are very focused and very narrow, and they can't sufficiently see broad enough to be able to connect these different mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. That was the promise of the liberal arts graduate, mm -hmm. right? That you had people that had some depth, but very broad breadth. Yeah. And, it, and, and, and they were just well-trained they were trained in math. They were trained in science. Mm -hmm. They were trained in uh, the classics. Mm -hmm. And they can take a problem, break it down, and understand it pulling from those entities. Well, the science that they study nowadays is not the, it, it's natural science. It's mm -hmm. not the built environment. Mm -hmm. It's not the environment of science and, and technology in which we live in. Yeah. So we hurt the liberal arts graduate by not, you know, why aren't our liberal arts graduates, why aren't they coding? Yeah. They should take a couple of classes in coding. Right. Right. Why is it that our engineers don't take foreign languages? 77% mm -hmm. of all new research capacity is being done globally, yeah. not in the U.S. There's no such thing as a U.S. Uh, it used to be a U.S. blue chip company is what we used to call them, right? Mm -hmm. These are all global multinational corporations. You name it. Google, mm -hmm. Facebook, Apple, uh, Apple. All of these are global multinational corporations. They source their talent globally. Mm -hmm. So why are we focused yeah. on, uh, you know, uh, on, on educating people in such narrow areas and not making them broad enough? Yeah. So the education system needs to change in order to do I have a long, well, not a long, but I have a probably 15 minute or so TED talk uh, on this. Okay. So the concept of renaissance needs to be reestablished yeah. in our schools today. Yeah. And we need, to, uh, uh, we, we need to raise up a, a cadre of, of, of people who actually 
understand what happens when you flip the light switch mm -hmm. and how that power and, and energy gets to the light to turn it on, right? Yeah, yeah. But they also understand the complex relationships between the U.S. and Mexico, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? They, yeah. And, 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 and they're able to understand the economic implications of, of immigrants coming into our country and how, how vast, how, how much of a benefit mm -hmm. those individuals have been. We like that today. Yeah. We have the people who know that stuff mm -hmm. don't know enough of technology. The people yeah. who know technology don't know the other. Yeah. And so that's where the tension is. And so what we're trying to do at Mason, we are taking a look at restructuring our core, redeveloping the, uh, our students in order to be focused, mm -hmm. uh, in order to have a, a greater focus in, in, in breath-like areas, right? Yeah. Uh, IBM coined this term a number of years ago, uh, the coined the term, instead of having I individuals where mm -hmm. you're deep and narrow, we need T. Mm. So you have some depth, right. but then you have this breadth across a bunch of areas. Yeah. That was the original promise of liberal arts. Mm -hmm. But somehow we've forgotten to feel, we've forgotten to understand that the science and the mathematics and the technology part that people learn 50 and 60 years ago mm -hmm. was never really adapted to the built environment of today. Yeah. And somehow we forgot that engineering as a discipline is itself a liberal art. Mm. We're, we're the modern day physicists. See, mm -hmm. physics is, is a liberal art. Why should mm -hmm. engineering be? Mm -hmm. the, the modern day physicist yeah. is an engineer. Yeah. And so there's no reason why they shouldn't understand the classics and languages and all of that stuff too. And that's what we got to get back to. Yeah, and it seems um, that one of the areas that that will necessarily be an area of growth, people who can wrestle with the ethical and moral questions created by emerging technologies. Mm -hmm. So you you mentioned your background in in terms of of, of vehicles and right. you know the classic question of when you have when we truly have autonomous vehicles and they have a choice between, <laughs> you know, run, you know, hitting a, a group of older people or one young person. What what choice do they make? And the ethical and moral questions around the uh, development of artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. and, and and that is an area where we're going to really need people who have both a grounding in maybe maybe some timeless uh, principles and of, of of ethics and and morality and and philosophical grounding, but also understand the technology enough to apply those principles or yeah. think through how to apply But them. it's not just an artificial intelligence. We're dealing with those issues. You know, people look at that, and I've heard this question plenty of times. Yeah. People look at that issue, and it seems like it's far off. Right. But we have CRISPR-Cas9 technology that's available to us right now yeah. that many of our scientists, many at Mason, are using. And mm -hmm. what CRISPR-Cas9 technology allows you to do is you, you literally can take genes out mm -hmm. of an entity mm -hmm. and put other genes and DNA into an entity. Yeah. And so without going into a lot of technical jargon, if you, uh, if you, if, if you, if you want a kid that is six foot five, right. has 180 IQ right. and the like, once those expressed genes are identified, you know, that a DNA is identi identified, yeah. it can actually be placed into your kid. Right. You know, while that kid is developing. Yeah. And that's the kind of kid you can have. Yeah. Well, that's we're using that technology on fruit flies now. Mm -hmm. At Mason, we used it on uh, 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 ferrets. We were mm -hmm. able to uh, basically repopulate an, an endangered species, a black-footed ferret. Hmm. Uh, by taking uh, the the genetic content of of black footed ferrets and yeah. expressing it into you know normal ferrets or yeah. uh, household ferrets or right. you know we American ferrets we're mm -hmm. able to do that and expand wow. those populations hmm. uh, there are all sorts of crazy mm -hmm. uh, uh, technologies coming out of Asia where they mm -hmm. you know you're taking the uh, genes from bulldogs and mixing it with the genes from beagles and you yeah. get these super yeah. beagle bulldogs, right. you know, and, 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 
and and there are ethical questions sure. around that, right? The technologist always answers the question, "Can I?" Yeah. The technologist should be answering the question, "Should I?" Yeah. And the real technologist, the really good one, answers the question, "How should I?" Mm. Right? Those are humanist principles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and so it tells you that the technologist doesn't have enough of a humanist background because they don't even think about it. It's, yeah. Can I do it? <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm, 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 how can I do it? I'm going to, and how can I make this work? They're not yeah. thinking about should I make it work and how should, uh, how should or how shouldn't I do? It, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Wow, fascinating. Incredible work that's being done right here at George Mason. Oh, but, yeah, without big, question. Big question. So I'll go back to jobs. Mm -hmm. um, as you, you have pointed out, um, I think at the time, Last December, you noted there were 31,000 unfilled jobs in Fairfax County, more than that now. Um, exactly. We still have people unemployed looking for jobs, even though that, that rate has, has gone down. Why do we have that gap between jobs that are available and people who are out of work? Yeah, this is, very, this is a, uh, a very interesting quandary. Uh, primarily be, it's primarily because uh, the skill set necessary for the jobs that are needed are not uh, in the pool of applicants mm -hmm. who are searching for those jobs, right? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and then you have a, uh, the secondary issue where you have a whole cohort of lower paying, unskilled type jobs uh, that, those, that, that people are trying to get out of mm -hmm. so that they can better themselves and do better for themselves. Mm -hmm. This presents probably the greatest opportunity for education uh, that, that I've seen in the last 20 years, mm -hmm. right? Because through upskilling and reskilling, through re-education programs, or through traditional academic mechanisms, we actually are reasonably equipped to help people navigate from, I'm in this career, I don't like it, and I need to get to a higher paying job or a more fulfilling job or a better job that matches my skill set mm -hmm. or a job that's in, in higher demand. And then from the corporate side, if they're willing, if, if they're willing to think about it in a non-traditional sense, right? Mm -hmm. I, I need a programmer. Well, can you take this business information major here mm -hmm. who's taken six months of Java and uh, Swift and other uh, uh, programming languages, can you take that person is that person going to be sufficient for your job yeah. needs? Yeah. Oftentimes, uh, the answer has been no, even though the person is actually qualified for the job. Mm. So that's the piece that we're trying to yeah. resolve now. We're trying to help educate and train people for the opportunities that are out there mm -hmm. and then get companies to interview and hire those folks, right? We call it the Mason Talent Exchange. And it's a program that we started over, we started it during the pandemic to deal with this very issue mm -hmm. of this job mismatch. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that, because you earlier talked about this acceleration and the adoption of new, a new, of new technologies, it seems like that also means for someone entering the job market, it probably means, whereas 50 years ago, you might have been able to have a 40 year long career in television, mm -hmm. repair, even repairing television right. um, or working in television, that kind of thing probably isn't going to happen as technology, the cycles of technological change accelerate. So how do we create that feedback loop for people to reskill mm -hmm. themselves as the market changes and technology changes? Well, you, br you, you brought up a really significant issue. Look, when I was a college student, uh, there were no touchstone phones. I, I'm sorry, there were no cell phones. Right. We were just getting into touchstone phones, and some of them, some of us had the ones where you rotary. put your finger in the rotary, rotary, rotary yeah, right? right? You remember yeah. those? Yeah. And um, it was ten cent a minute, which was cheap back yeah. in the day, for me to call my girlfriend literally in the next city over. Right. Yeah. Okay. And and that was the technology of the day. Mm -hmm. And fast forward to now, most people don't use their phones at home, and there definitely aren't many rotary phones mm -hmm. in existence at all, and very few of the touchstone ones, right? 
So all of the people who were in the telephone business when I was a college student, mm -hmm. right? When I was, you know, moving through my career, they either had to they either had to move over to the wireless mm -hmm. realm, they had mm -hmm. to be educated out of that, yep. or they had to be pushed out of those jobs, right? Mm -hmm. And it probably was distressing for them because you saw millions of people change platform. Mm -hmm. That meant billions of dollars moved to the wireless platform mm -hmm. and hundreds of thousands of jobs went away. They were no longer needed. Yeah. But hundreds of thousands of jobs on this other end mm -hmm. was created. Yep. That's going to be the norm forever mm -hmm. because technology now is changing much faster than it was. That's why I gave you the little pitch yeah. in the beginning. It's changing much faster than what it was mm -hmm. 25, 30 years ago when I was in school. And so we have to have the educational systems that are flexible enough, yeah. that are adaptive enough, and we gotta help people get, and this is where you come in, we gotta help people get their mindsets to the point mm -hmm. where they're comfortable with embracing and accepting that change. Yeah. You you know, I saw something really significant happen just during the time that I was here at Mason. Mm -hmm. In this past year, uh, when I first came to campus to visit right before the shutdown, <clears throat> I parked in the lot there where the, uh, you know, the, one of the student parking lots, student faculty staff parked there. And there were an overwhelming number of gasoline cars. The reason I know this is because at that particular time, I was driving a Prius mm -hmm. back in California. And I was looking around, oh, man, there are hardly no electric vehicles here. Right, right. Looking around right, in the parking lot. Right, right, <laughs> Nothing. right. Fast forward to today. Yeah just probably about a third of the vehicles mm -hmm. in that very same parking lot in that very same area where I parked are yeah. electric now. Yeah. We're s literally seeing it happen in front of our eyes. Yeah. What about all those people who are in the gasoline and combustion business? They're now seeing that sure. job shift and yeah. seeing more opportunities come up in the electric vehicle space, right? Yeah. You've seen the rise of Tesla. There's a mm -hmm. an electric F-150 now on the market. There's an electric Mustang on the market. Right. The, the electric Cadillac just came out. Those, it's real, right? Yeah. And so that's how fast technology, it's one year. Yeah. That's how fast technology changes yeah. on us now. And what, given that, what, because you could, from from what you just described there, that shift in technology, that shift in the job market, some could argue, and some do argue, that a four-year university is an is an outdated model because mm -hmm. spending four years getting one degree in X to train myself to do X is going to be obsolete by the time I graduate or shortly thereafter. And we need a system of education that's much more nimble than the traditional four-year universities. What, what would you say to someone who makes I, that argument? What I would say to them is the four years is only the beginning and uh, it's not enough. How do I say this and not scare the bejesus out of <laughs> people? Look, the, for all of you out there, look, the, the reality is this one. Yeah, this is important because I'm, I'm planning, you know, I got to figure out my 90, son's college fund here too. Now you're telling me here, I got to have here, Here's coming, yeah. here's coming. 90% of all information ever created has been created in the last two years. Yeah, 90% of all information ever created, mm. and, 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 and what do we do at academic institutions? We help people understand and learn that information. Yeah. So you need your, your four year degree is the entry stakes, mm -hmm. but you're gonna be lifelong learning. And that's the point that I'm trying to make to you, the flexibility that people have to have. So they'll get a four year degree in something, Yeah. and then they'll spend the rest of their lives learning what they need to learn mm -hmm. for the opportunities that are coming in front of them mm -hmm. with the understanding that those opportunities may only exist two to four years mm -hmm. before they have to learn something else and go on to the next thing. Yeah. 
So this whole idea that you can be in one area for 25, for 30, for 35 years is gone. Mm -hmm. And so that means the academic institutions will change, mm -hmm. but we will always need an institution to help people learn. Mm -hmm. Will you need a four-year degree? In some instances, yes. In some instances, no. It depends on what you want to do. Mm -hmm. Like I said, if you uh, that four-year degree could be the entry mm -hmm. start point. Mm -hmm. But even with that degree, you're going to have to continue to learn. Yeah. And that's the one thing that I don't think people understand. You're not done. Yeah. You will never be done mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. That's going away. Yeah. And it doesn't matter if you go to a community college for two years mm -hmm. or a year and a half, or if you do some online thing and you get the knowledge you need for that particular job right quick, mm -hmm. great. Mm -hmm. It ain't going to be around but so long. Yeah. And you're going to have to go to another program somewhere else and get another set of skills mm -hmm. to prepare you for that next job yeah. or prepare you to progress and move up. That's more of the reality that we're going towards. That's where our academic institutions have to be. You are absolutely right. We're not nimble enough yet to get there, but that's a big part of educational change, mm -hmm. and that's what I'm devoting my life uh, to doing. And Thanks. you mentioned uh, community college, and one of I think the most powerful and impactful programs mm -hmm. that George Mason has in partnership with the Northern Virginia Community College, it's yes. Annandale campus, also in the Braddock district, is uh, the, the Pathway Program Advance. That's right. Tell us about Advance, how does it work, and what is the value that it provides to George Mason University? So. Uh, the way it works is a, it's a what, what's called a classic two plus two program. You do two years at, at uh, Northern Virginia Community College. You do two years at Mason. You get two degrees, right? Mm -hmm. You get your associates and you get your bachelor's. Uh, we, we have more than 100 programs focused in this space. They're in the areas of highest need to the community. Mm -hmm. So that's critical and key. Mm -hmm. We've done this in areas of high need. So you can't do any major mm -hmm. through this partnership, but you can do those areas that are in high need to the region. Mm -hmm. so, so that's one benefit. The other is we're able to take our counselors, our administrators, our people who do extraordinarily well in helping students matriculate, and we're able to offer those services to students at Northern Virginia Community College. Mm. Right. So what does that mean? They matriculate better. Mm. They, they, they're processed faster. They, mm -hmm. so, Right now, um, it's sub 20% is the actual completion rate for students who start community college. Wow. Sub 20%. Wow. Our program right now, we're covering right around 80% hmm. of those students that matriculate mm -hmm. through. And so if we can get you through in the right major, attach a four-year degree on the end of it with no loss in time, guess what you've done? You've gotten a four-year degree at a third or more less cost, mm -hmm. and, you, and you've gotten it in the same period of time. You, 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 you get what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's what we call a classic win-win, mm. right? Yeah. <laughs> Everybody wins. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you talk about the, the um, community college graduation rate, and I, I read a study once that um, – demonstrated that a huge percentage of um, community college and uh, lower income students at four-year universities uh, who don't graduate don't graduate because they have one instance or one string of bad luck in their life or a financial setback. Usually so it's a social economic issue. Mom or dad gets sick, lose a job. Mm -hmm. Car breaks down. Yeah. And then they can't afford yeah. even the lower tuition they're paying. But the state government has done a lot to help with mm -hmm. this. And these high need areas, if you're low income or middle income, now the programs, uh, or a number of those programs through the G3 yeah. uh, mm -hmm. uh, initiative are free. Yeah. So those students don't pay anything to go. And we are putting in place a program here at Mason that says, okay, You've gone free for community college, and now when you get to Mason, we're going to meet 100% of your need yep. on the back end. Yep. So if, you're 100, if your need is all of it, then the reality is you won't pay anything at Mason either. Yeah. 
and 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 so the benefit to us is we think it's going to open an access portal mm -hmm. uh to opportunity yeah that we've never seen before yeah yeah our job is uh you, you know there used to be a a, a time where you had what's called open enrollment. Mm -hmm. With open enrollment at state schools meant that if you had a pulse right. and you applied, you got in. Yeah. You got a chance and an opportunity. Right. And the washout rates were extraordinarily high. Yeah. This is back in the old days of look to your right, look to your left. Two of those people won't be here in four years, right? Right, right, right. right. So what universities did is move past that by admitting fewer people. Yeah. Right. What we've been doing at Mason is admitting more and more and more. We're up to about 87 percent of those that apply to Mason mm -hmm. actually get in. Yeah. So it's a high probability that you'll get in. Mm -hmm. But let's say you don't. Mm -hmm. Everybody can get into a community college. Right. And if you can get into a community college through our program, mm -hmm. like this NOVA program, uh, you can actually matriculate into Mason and graduate still. Yeah. And, and here's the other thing. Look. This partnership with NOVA is substantial for a whole host of other reasons. It's mm -hmm. providing access. It's educating. Uh, it's providing opportunities to cohorts of the community that never had those opportunities offered to them before. Mm -hmm. Our folk at Northern Virginia that we are working with, they really care about students. They really care about engaging them. They've done an extraordinary job at, you know, at bringing students through those first two years. And then we've provided supplementary advising around them uh, to help support those students. And then, and then our job is to get them through mm -hmm. the next two at Mason. Uh, we're well over 1,800 students in the program now. Mm. So, so this is not a small program right. at all. And uh, we think it's gonna grow and, and be a model that's scalable throughout the whole state of Virginia. And so we have started a program called the Mason Virginia Promise. Mm -hmm. And what that program does is that it promises either an advanced degree or your own business for every Virginian that wants it. And that's every Virginian, no matter where you are. Yeah. You get to a community college, you can get to us. Mm -hmm. If you can't get to a community college and get to us, or if you don't want to, you can, we'll, we'll help you start your own business. Wow. Because Mason manages the 33 small business development centers mm -hmm. that are strewn throughout the state of Virginia. We yeah. manage all of them. Yeah. And so if you want to be a plumber, Mason can help you. And you want to start a plumbing business, we can help you. Mm -hmm. if, you, if, 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 you if you're a mechanic, you want to start your own auto mechanic business, we can help you. Yeah. All right? And so the idea is just to help people where they are, position them where they are to be viable, successful uh, citizens. We think we can do that. Yeah. Great. It's very exciting. Very yeah. exciting. Um, I'll change uh, topics a little bit. You recently outlined uh, some some of your goals mm -hmm. for the university. Um, one of them was uh, your plan for George Mason to to leap uh, more than forty spots <laughs> up the uh, U.S. <laughs> News and World Report ranking to get into the top one hundred uh, national universities in the country. Um, so tell us about that that goal. How do you plan to get there? And, and what are some of the other goals that you laid out for the university? Well, uh, how we plan to get there is rankings are metric driven. And so if you take a look at the metrics and manipulate the metrics, manage the metrics, you can manage yourself higher We've taken a look at six of the metrics that pertain uh, out of a, about 20 different mm -hmm. metrics that go into the ranking calculations. Yeah. About six of them we believe that we can make substantial changes in our programs so that we can move up substantially. And we're going to put mechanisms in place to improve in those areas, and that should drive our rankings. We mm -hmm. hadn't started this yet. Yeah. We plan to start it this year. So we're using this year's rankings as a baseline. Mm -hmm. So all the way up to this time, we basically we've taken the rankings that we've gotten. Whatever right. the rankings are, that's where we, you know. Yeah. But now we're actively managing mm -hmm. the rankings. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, do we jump up 40 spots? 
I don't know. <laughs> right? And, and, and you got you're right. talking about going in over a five year period or so. Sure. Do we go up forty spots? I don't know. But if we go up twenty, right, that's a big deal. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So. So that's a big. That's mm-hmm. the one with that one. Mm-hmm. Um, I've already told you about the the, the Mason Virginia Promise. That's mm-hmm. our biggest mm-hmm. initiative. Mm-hmm. Um, we also have uh, programs to grow research and mm-hmm. grow our engagement with companies and support. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Mason Talent Exchange mm-hmm. is one. We have a whole initiative emanating out of our growth in computer science graduates and the like out of our Arlington campus, but also mm-hmm. in some of our main campus here uh, in terms of producing larger numbers of graduates and a mm-hmm. uh, larger number of tech graduates. Mm-hmm. We're sitting a little bit shy of 40,000 students right now. Mm-hmm. And our goal is to get to 50,000. Yeah. So that means you're talking over the next f- five to seven years, we need to grow 1,500 plus students per year. Mm-hmm. Uh, we think that that's doable, mm-hmm. even in this difficult environment. Uh, but it's going to require, so that's why you see we have many of these other programs, because yeah. they can feed the enrollment growth mm-hmm. to the campus. Um, we're going to have to figure out what's happening with students today, yeah. because uh, just like it's changed the workforce, mm-hmm. it's changed the way people engage the workforce, it's changed the way people engage academic institutions. Sure. So it's going to take us a year or so to kind of get an understanding of what the mm-hmm. psyche and dynamics is of our students these days, but we think we'll get back on that growth trend very, very soon. We are, uh, w- you know, we're looking to engage this community in a profound way, be an mm-hmm. integral part of the community, and that's through our uh, work with our, uh, our our school of visual and performing arts. Mm-hmm. That's with our athletic programs. Uh, we we want to restructure and revamp all of our athletic facilities mm-hmm. uh, there to uh, add more fields, bring the community in for tournaments, bring the community in for all sorts of things. Uh, so all of those discussions and plans are ongoing. Look, the reality is is that we are building a world class twenty first century university. Mm-hmm. It's it's this place. It hasn't been the university uh, that most people uh, grew up with probably for the last five to seven years. Yeah. And it's going to continue to evolve Mm -hmm. into something, you know, a a large 21st century institution that is really uh, a driver for economic growth, a driver for... Uh, educational opportunities mm-hmm. and a driver of wealth and opportunity in our region. Yeah, and so we want the citizens all over our region, but particularly here mm-hmm. in this county, yeah. to actually see the institution that way and to engage it yeah. in that manner. And one thing connected to that 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 we should touch on for the listeners is the master planning process that's mm-hmm. that's ongoing to to look at the future of um, not just the Fairfax campus but for our, yep. um, for our three campuses for, for for all three campuses uh, but for most of our listeners probably most interested in the future of the of the Fairfax campus and that process has been I have to I've, I've, I've credited you and your team before but mm-hmm. I think the outreach to the to the broader community across the county including the neighborhood surrounding the university has been top notch and people have had a chance to be at the table and be engaged through countless, I don't even know how many uh, public meetings there have been so far and that, and that process will continue. And there's some very exciting um, concepts that maybe is the right, yep. the right uh, term at this point. They're, for, they're for concepts, the they're campus. concepts until they're funded. Right. Right. <laughs> right yeah. Everything <laughs> is. Yeah. Every, everything is. So, it, uh, any anything on the master planning process or well it, it's moving along right now as planned we yeah. we've we completed the first phase of the master plan and so we actually have a document that describes mm-hmm. the kinds of things we want to do yeah. in uh, the broader Fairfax community but also in Arlington and in and out in uh, Prince William yeah. and so that piece is done uh, now we have to operationalize and implement 
yeah. uh, those pieces, right? I mean, all told, it's $3 billion worth mm -hmm. of additional construction to realize yeah. what's in those plans, yeah. at least $3 billion. Yeah. Uh, we're not going to do that in a short time span. Mm -hmm. But the idea here is that we will start to chip away at components of that each year. Mm -hmm. And over a five to 10 year period, we're gonna put a significant dent mm -hmm. in that. The, 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 the great thing is now we have a plan yeah. for what that growth should look like. Yeah, and, and you know, know, we're talking about the university not being what it was even five to seven years ago and, mm -hmm. and dramatic change. And, and one of the things that uh, has changed and will have to continue to change is you know, historically, when George Mason University grew, more students, more faculty, more staff, the um, assumption was that they would all drive to the campus. That's right. Uh, and that's not a sustainable solution that's for right. any entity uh, anymore, but certainly here in Fairfax County, given the, the, the traffic and transportation challenges mm -hmm. we have, we got to find creative ways to get people physically to that campus. Although, as you hinted at, um, uh, certainly more virtual learning will be part of Mason's future. Uh, so it's not going to... Learning look, will be... Look. Learning will be... So I'll give you a classic example. Right now, our campus is fully open. Mm -hmm. We're the largest we've ever been. Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. We're the largest we've ever been. Our campus is fully open. Yep. But traffic yeah. has not been as significant right. in and around the campus. I know yeah. I drive it. Yeah. Yeah. I come in in the mornings. I drive around during lunchtime. Yeah. You know, we get a little back up around 5 o'clock. Right. And you know why that is? It's because the mode of how we deliver instruction now is hybrid. Yeah. We have some classes that are meeting in class. We have some classes that are meeting online. Right. And so... Our overall utilization of the campus has mm -hmm. changed and mm -hmm. changed dramatically. Mm -hmm. And you're seeing that in the traffic patterns. Remember I told you earlier, we have to get an understanding yeah. of what uh, the modern student wants. We're still developing that. Yeah. And then my goal is to focus our curricula around that understanding. And it's going to be different than the traditional, you come in, sage on the stage, Right. You know, the, 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 the faculty member teaches for an hour, an hour and a half, and then you go home. Yeah. It's going to be much more uh, flexible mm -hmm. than that. Mm -hmm. Some classes will be in person. Some classes will be online. Some classes will be delivered both. And that means that we're going to engage the campus in a very, very different way. It was always a hard sell to faculty mm -hmm. until the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Now everybody knows they can do it because yeah. they had to. Yeah. Right. And so it's opened up lots of opportunities for restructuring our curricula that yeah. was that were not there before. So I can tell you that we're going to grow the campus. I can also tell you that you're not going to see the same attachment and, uh, to growth as you see as, as you have seen in the past. Yeah. Yeah. In terms of traffic patterns. Right. So those are going to change. Right. And then in addition, again, we want to be a partner. Mm -hmm. So to the extent that we can work with you and we can work with the community to do things that open up yeah. uh, greater access to the campus, yep. that open up tra traffic lanes to the mm -hmm. campus, mm -hmm. we also can, can do some stuff to alleviate traffic. I mean, you know, right across... On Campus Drive now, there's a development going in that's going to put hundreds of housing units right right there in the you know before you move into Fairfax City proper. Mm -hmm. Yep, hundreds of University units. Drive. You know yep. this, right? Yep. yep. And that's going to change traffic patterns, right? Yep. And so we're we're going to have to think about mm -hmm. how now a large number of those, without question, a large number of those individuals are going to be accessing the campus. Right. They're literally going to be walking across the street. Right. Right. right? Uh, so, so to that extent, traffic won't be as bad, but there will be additional cars right. come around when that happens. And so mm -hmm. we have to start thinking about what we do with the traffic flows in those areas. Yeah. And 
that's why the master plan is important because if you know what we want to do with that space and right. we see what's happening in, in you know in the county and the city there then we can reach agreements on how we can mutually support each other yeah. to 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 alleviate that congestion and strain yeah great and and we've had a great partnership in that in yep. that vein so far we're we're almost out of time and we'll fi- we'll finish on a on a fun note, uh, George Mason's robots. Yes. So folks who have been on campus have have seen seen the, uh, old the, robots. the robots. Tell us about about the robots, and do you have any plans in terms of what more of these robots could be doing in the future on George Mason's well, campus? Well, so they've delivered more than thirty thousand meals. They were a primary way of getting food to students during the pandemic. Mm-hmm. It. Uh, I don't know what we would have done if we didn't have them. Yeah. So they were tremendously helpful for us in terms of keeping people safe. It was one of the ways in which we kept transmission rates down hmm. uh, in, 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 during the pandemic. It, it, it worked beautifully for yeah. us. It, uh, you know, uh, the company, we were the first, and there are probably now some 100, 200 universities using those robots now. Wow. The very first institution in the country to use them mm-hmm. was George Mason. Okay. And... Um, their goal is to start branching out of the university community into the surrounding areas. Ah, okay. So uh-huh. I think what you're going to see in the future is that those hmm. little vehicles, not just delivering food to our students, yeah. but delivering food to residents around the country. And hmm. you got that one university. Right, yeah. Can yeah. guarantee you by the time it's up and running, <laughs> there will be robots there delivering robots food. Robots over there. Okay. All right. Something, something to look forward to. That's right. Uh, Dr. Washington, anything else for our listeners before we wrap up? Look forward to a dynamic community and a dynamic Mason community with uh, lots of students, really fun things happening, a real integral part of the uh, community. That's what you're going to see. And so... I'll tell the residents of the community to just get ready for the ride. We look forward to their feedback and their engagement throughout the whole process, and we're going to be responsive to, to, to the community's needs. All right, Dr. Gregory Washington, uh, the eighth president of George Mason University, incredible guest. Thank you so much for joining us, and thank you all for tuning in to Braddock Voices, where we talk to Braddock District and Fairfax County residents and leaders working to make our community even better. As always, to stay up to date with future episodes, community news, and local events, you can sign up for our Braddock District email list. Just send us an email, braddock at fairfaxcounty.gov, and we'll send those updates right to your inbox. Thanks for listening.